those lines in, uh, in, in, in pop culture, or I don't know, it's just pretty common where you hear this idea of what do you, what do you get what do you get for the man who has everything? Have you heard that before? <laughs> what do you get for the man who has everything? I mean, people say that when it comes time for someone's birthday or anniversary or at Christmas. What do you get for the man who has everything? And, uh, you know, I, 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 I realize more and more that I'm that man. You know, and I'm not saying that I'm some kind of jet-setting billionaire like Scrooge Madoo out swimming in gold or anything like that. But the truth is, uh, I feel like I have a lot know I feel really well taken care of I think really all of us should regardless of circumstances if only because we're experiencing such profound freedom here in our in our country but I, I feel like I'm this guy who has everything and 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 what happens for me the older I get is there's a particular question that gets asked this time of year that's actually <laughs> really hard for, it's getting harder and harder for me to be able to answer this question and and it's this what do you want for Christmas Brian what do, you, what do you want for Christmas? Now, when I was a kid, and you asked me that question, I had 5,000 answers, okay? But the older I get, and the more I'm able to take stock of my life and see what I have and see what my life is comprised of, the more and more when someone asks me, what, what do you want for Christmas, Brian? I just want to respond, I, you know what, I don't know. I, I don't really feel like I, I need anything. I don't really feel like I want much of anything. But at the same time, I push myself to try and find an answer to that question, because I know the loved one, like the family member or the good friend that asked that question of me, I, I know what they're, they're trying to do is they love me, they like me, it's Christmas time, we exchange gifts, we want to try and find the perfect gift for you, Brian, so what do, what do you want for Christmas? So I push myself to try and answer it. Sometimes it gets really awkward. I, uh, this really has nothing to do with the sermon, but I couldn't help but think of it. I don't know, Sarah, if you remember the very first Christmas we had together when we were a married couple uh, it was a little awkward for me because of Thanksgiving before that Christmas. Sarah and I were sitting on the couch in her parents' house. Uh, the meal had just gotten done, and Sarah's mom, Lorraine, comes in and, and, and asks us this question. Hey, Christmas is coming up. What do, what do you guys want for Christmas? I said, L -l Lorraine, I don't, I don't really know what I want or need. I don't really, oh, come on, Brian. Just, why not, here's a pen. Why don't you and Sarah write a few ideas down? Well, when I was growing up, what my parents did was, it was they said, just write down whatever you want, and we'll kind of choose from that. That's what I thought she was asking me to do. Well, when she comes back and says, okay, can I have the list? Sarah hands basically a post-it note and says like, oh, I, I just kind of like a crock pot. And I handed three sheets of paper because I thought it was just tell us as much as you can and we'll just pick some things from it. And I know your dad was probably sitting there saying, my daughter married a complete consumeristic snake, you know. And I don't even think, as best I recall, I don't even think I got anything on my list anyway. That was the year, wasn't it, that your dad gave me all those tools? I just kept opening tools. I, I didn't even know what they were. I'm a minister. I don't know what tools are. Like, I'd open it up and be like, look at this, Sarah. Look what you're doing. Bob, what is this? You're like, that's a hammer, Brian. It's a hammer. You're an idiot, not just a snake. What do you want for Christmas, Brian? I don't, I don't know. I don't, even, I don't know how to answer that question anymore because I feel like I not only have everything that I want, but I, I definitely feel like I have everything that I need. But I push myself to try and answer that question. What do you want for Christmas, Brian? What do you give to the guy who has everything? At the same time, I'm kind of lying when I say I don't really know what I would want for Christmas. Um, because truth be told, the older, the older that I get and the more that I take stock of the deepest needs that I have, like I know exactly what I want. And there really is such a thing as a perfect gift. Just the problem is, is that when you ask me a question, well, what do you want for Christmas, Brian? I don't know how to answer, even though I know what the answer is, because what I want is not something you could give me anyway. You know, you know I read the story of God in the Bible, um, and, 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 and you read it all the way through to the end, and, and you come to the book of Revelation, which is this incredibly intimidating, overwhelming, mysterious book, and I get that. I don't think it has to be as overwhelming and intimidating as we make it, because I think it's a little simpler than we sometimes make it. Um, but we come to the very end of the story, and what happens here is we've been talking about Advent. Jesus is coming. One day he will come again. And, and among other things, what the book of Revelation lays out for us is what it's going to look like on that day when Jesus comes back. What it's going to look like, in particular, Revelation chapters 21 and 22, really get into this moment where when Jesus comes again, the whole world is going to be made 
over again. It's going to be recreated. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth that replaces the old heaven and the old earth where there has been such profound brokenness and pain and aching. Like it will be replaced and it will settle in here among the earth. We often talk about us going to heaven, but if you read Revelation 21, it says the new heavens and new earth are coming down to us and spreading out. And it's erasing the old heaven and the old earth and it's a new heaven and new earth. And as you read further in Revelation 21 and 22, there's this beautiful image in which it also says there's this city that's coming down as well. And it's the place where the people of God are going to dwell. I read a little bit about this last week when I was reading Revelation 21. It's a place, and really even more than that, it's a people. It's where, where God's people are going to dwell with God. He will be their God, and they will be his people. In this city, it kind of replaces the Garden of Eden. It's like Eden. It's paradise. It's going to be perfect. It's stunning, and it's beautiful. And we read about this in Revelation 21. You can follow along on the screen here. Uh, this is what's described, and John's been given this vision. He's the one who writes down this vision in the book of Revelation, and John says, I, I, I looked and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. I saw this holy city, this new Jerusalem that was coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for a husband. So here, a whole world's been made, and then there's going to be this dwelling place for us. And John said, I heard this loud voice from the throne that was saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. It's just beautiful. And this angel comes up to John and said, now, come here, I, I want to show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Remember, that I wanna, what he's saying is, I want to show you this city, this dwelling place for God and his people. And John writes, and so the angel carried me away in the spirit to a mountain that was great and high, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, that was coming down out of heaven from God and was settling there in this new heaven and new earth. And it shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of this very precious jewel, like, like a jasper, a very precious jewel in the ancient world. It was clear as crystal, and, and, and yet it had these great high walls. And the angel comes back and, and talks with John. It says, the angel who talked to me, he had, a, he had a measuring rod of gold that could measure the city and these great high walls. And the city was laid out like a square. It was as long as it was wide. And he measured the city with the rod, and he found it to be 12,000 stadia in length. It was as wide and as high as it is long, so 12,000 stadia long and wide and high. And then the angel measured the wall using human measurement, and it was 144 cubits thick. Now I want to stop there because right now you're sitting here saying that doesn't make a lick of sense to me. But what I want to point out to you is these are really big walls. Like the, the, the city of God where we can be his people and it's going to be a place of perfection. Uh, we read later in Revelation 21 that in this city, in this dwelling place, there will be no tears, there will be no sickness, there will be no death, there will be no night. It's the most stunning, beautiful vision we could possibly have, this city that comes down out of heaven where people can dwell with God. And yet there's this huge obstacle because it's got these enormous walls, 12,000 stadia long and wide and high. If you translate that into modern-day terms, these walls are 1,400 miles long, 1,400 miles wide. 1,400 miles tall. To give you perspective on how big that is, they are as wide and long and high as it is from here to Salt Lake City, Utah. Those are really big walls. And then John goes a step further and says, when I watched the angel measure out these walls, it wasn't just that they were so long and so wide and so high. It said, I found out they were, what was it? It's 144 cubits thick. You know what that translates to in modern day terms? They were 200 feet thick. That is the length of four school buses parked bumper to bumper. 
These walls are huge and they are thick. It goes on also, you see there at the end of verse 18, that these walls were made of jasper. Jasper was a precious stone that was incredibly durable. It was the most durable stone in that time of the ancient world. So you've got these walls that are 1,400 miles long and wide and high, and these walls are 200 feet thick, and they are comprised of a stone that is impenetrable. You aren't blasting through this thing. And you realize when you read this how heartbreaking this can feel. Because when you see this city and the angel declares what is going on within the city, what is going on for the people who are here and who are dwelling with God, no tears, no sickness, no death, no darkness, that you stand there and you think, I want in. But there is quite an obstacle in those walls, isn't there? And yet at the same time, you read it and it makes sense. Because if I built a city of a new heaven and new earth where there's supposed to be perfection, I'd probably build some walls to keep me out too. You know, it's another new year. I talked about this a little bit last week where we go into a new year. We're going into 2015. And what happens for us when we go into a new year is we find ourselves doing a great deal of self-reflection on the year that was, don't we? And for me, when I look back on 2014, I've used this imagery before where you know, there's mornings where I, I, w- I will wake up and uh, shower and get ready for the day and try and make myself look as presentable as I possibly can. And yet, even still, when I wipe the condensation from the mirror in the bathroom and I see me, and I don't mean just seeing what my hair looks like or something along those lines. I mean, I'm seeing me. I'm seeing things I've said and things I've done and things I've thought. I'm thinking about my carelessness at times with my money or with my words or, 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 or I'm thinking about all this. You know, really when you go into a new year, you come out of the year that was, and you'd like to think that you got all of these highlights of 2014, but most of us have a nice reel of lowlights, don't we? Most of what we remember is the stuff we just didn't get right. If I could just have it over to do again. And you go through these things. I go through this where I say, man, I I feel like there were so many moments that I swung and I missed as a husband, as a father, as a friend, as a minister, as a son. You know, there's moments where we know ourselves better than anybody else and we know just how despicable we can be. And I know that you feel this as well because I have conversations with all of you and I have these, I always have the same kinds of conversations as a year is coming to a close and a new year is beginning. I talked about this last week. I've got people that come up to me and say, man, this is the year. Can you help me? Because this is the year I want to read through the Bible in its entirety because I haven't been reading my Bible enough and I just, I need to be a better Christian. I need to be praying more because I just don't talk to God enough and I'm going to fast. I'm going to fast every single day this year. And right before I can sign me, say, if you do that, you'll probably die that you just keep going. And you know what? I just want to, I want to grow as a Christian father or a Christian mother. I want to grow as a Christian husband or a Christian wife. I want to grow as a Christian mother or father or aunt or uncle or grandparent because I just know in this year there's things I just didn't get right. And you just spend all this time in front of me just beating the tar out of yourself. And so when you come to Revelation 21 in this moment where this new heaven, this new earth is spreading out in this, this new city and you want in on it and yet you realize these walls that seem like these obstacles that are impenetrable and you realize it makes sense because if I'm making a perfect place, I'd probably keep me out. I'd find a way to keep the people like me out. And it hurts, and it's painful, and you weep, but you feel it's deserved. I wonder what John felt, because in Revelation 21, John's standing at a distance from the city. And there's moments in the book of Revelation where all of these beautiful images unfold, but there's moments where John and the whole host of heaven start weeping, because they realize we are unworthy of this. And we see these walls, and we think there's no way in. What do you want for Christmas, Brian? I want that. And I want to weigh in. Merry Christmas. Look at this. I left this part out in Revelation 21, and it's so important. The city did have great high walls, but there were 12 gates. The city had 
great high walls with 12 gates, and there were three gates on the east, and three on the north, and three on the south, and three on the west. If you look at this imagery in Revelation 21, these walls have gates. These walls have many gates from all directions. And it is beautiful. It's this beautiful closing image in the book of Revelation where the new heaven and new earth unfurl and this city is placed in the midst of it. And you see these high, these stunningly high walls and you gasp in their shadow and you weep because they seem impenetrable. But you spy with your eye these gates, many gates. You recognize it's not all wall. Thank God. There's a way in. That there's a a way in for me that I might be a part of these people, this multitude that John talks about throughout the book of Revelation. That there's a way in for you. That there's a way in for many people. There's something so global about this that is so beautiful to me that it says there's 12 gates, but take note of this. There's three of them on the north and three of them on the south and three of them on the east and three of them on the west. These are not American gates. These are global gates. These are the gates for the world of nations that millions might enter in. And I can only imagine that with all of these people coming from all of these directions who have all of these stories, that somewhere in these stories are probably stories even worse than mine, maybe. That all of us are these despicable people, and yet when God builds this new city, he makes known and tells John, you write this down, that the walls you see have gates. That there is a way in. It's a perfect gift. A way in for someone as low as me. And you know what the way in is, how this is even possible. It's told to us earlier in Revelation chapter 7. The way the, the gate's not even a gate, it's a person. You know this. It's the Sunday school answer. John writes earlier in Revelation 7, I looked and there before me was this great multitude that no one could count. And they were from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Do you hear it? These are the people who've entered in through the gates in the north and the south and the east and the west. And I love this, John writes, and they were wearing these white robes, these dazzling, clean, white robes. And this person came up and they asked me this question. John's constantly getting interrupted in the book of Revelation. He's trying to take it in, but someone comes up and starts talking to him. And John has asked this question, hey, those people in white robes, who are they? Where did they come from? And John answers, you know. And this person says, yes, these are the ones who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. It's the mystery and the beautiful of recognizing the gate is Christ himself, that we come to him with these despicable, soiled garments, and yet in the mystery, this is such weird language, but it's beautiful, it's the mystery of we can hand these garments to Christ, and he will dip them in the blood that was shed at the cross, and somehow they come out white. Stained by blood, but stained white made pure, made holy, that we might enter in, that we might be counted among the multitude. This gate, the perfect gift, Christ the gate, the perfect gift. In fact, John, the one who writes Revelation, is also the one who wrote the Gospel of John. If you read in John chapter 10, there is a moment, and I think this is an anticipatory kind of thing, where Jesus stands up before the people and he says, I am the great shepherd who has been sent by God to gather all the sheep that have been scattered and making a mess of things. And I will lead them home to the sheep pen. But what does Jesus say in John 10? He says, I'm not just a shepherd, I'm the gate, he says. That you might enter in. What do you want for Christmas? What do you want for Christmas? I want that. I want in on that. And what's beautiful is these walls have gates. And these walls have many gates from all directions. And I want to pause for just a moment there because we have to ask ourselves this question. If, 
if this is what God is building now for us, because remember Jesus says in John's gospel, I go and I prepare a place for you, this, this new city that will come, and, and we know that somewhere what is being built in this new city, and there are openings, there's these gates that are wide open to us now, and, and if in the end there's going to be these gates that we can enter through and be a part of all of this, then the question is, if that's what it's going to be like tomorrow, at the same time, what does that mean for today? Like if there are openings, and I've been given this perfect gift, it's the openings and the openness of all of this demands us to ask this question of ourselves, how open are we then? I mean, it starts very simply if you've never made the decision before by way of this beauty of faith and confession and repentance and baptism. That you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that you are buried with him in that grave of waters and then risen to new life. Because that's opening yourself to what is open before you. But yeah, this is where that reflection going into the new year is so incredibly important for us. You don't have any notion of getting rebaptized in Scripture. Maybe one, but it was kind of a unique thing in the book of Acts. It's too difficult to get into in this sermon. But you do see a whole lot of people who have been baptized before who are constantly going through the cycle of faith and confession and repentance, right? What a perfect gift, this opening, this gate. Am I open? Am I open? What do you want for Christmas? A perfect gift. Merry Christmas. Here's a gate. Never thought you'd have that under the tree. But it's a perfect gift. It's perfect for uh, another reason, too. And I want to add to, I guess, to my Christmas list before God because it's nice to be able to have this gate which lets me in. But the truth is, I so desperately also want there to be a gate because, quite frankly, it's kind of nice when there's a gate that can keep some things out for the rest of time. And what I mean by that is that as I go into the new year and I think about the moments that I have failed and the struggles that I've had, I recognize that a number of these choices are of my own doing. And yet I also recognize that a lot of times I stumble into sin or I'm overcome by adversity because I am being chased around by, get ready for it, you knew this was coming, I'm getting chased around by a dragon an awful lot. Been doing your Advent readings that Austin put together for us this past week because you encountered the dragon, didn't you? Satan. And man, he's wrecking my life. And so I I sit here and I think to myself, now this is going to get weird in just a moment because it seems like my Christmas request on my list does not get answered. But man, I want a gate that's open so that I can step in. But I also want one that can close because I'm sick and tired of the dragon. Are you? Well, look at this. Revelation 21. The city had great high walls with 12 gates. But look on verse 25. This is so interesting. And on no day will the city's gates ever be shut. Now, on one front, what I can sit back and I can think to myself, well, the reason the gates are never shut is because, well, the, the, God's letting people in and there's a great multitude, but that's not the case because all is said and done, like, like the holy ones have entered in to this city and so there's no one else who's going to be entering in. Why are you leaving the gates open? Because what happens here, and I have it up on the slide, is all of a sudden these gates seem completely unnecessary. You know what I mean? Like, why would you have a door or a gate if you're just going to leave it open? Because one of the main purposes of a door or a gate is that you close it to keep things out. In fact, it's not just that the gates are completely unnecessary, but this just renders the walls completely unnecessary. Why do you have these walls that are 1,400 miles long and wide and high, and you've built them so they're 200 feet thick, and yet you have gates and you're like, just leave them open. Everything seems completely unnecessary. And so what happens is you begin to realize that must mean that these walls... And these wide open gates are nothing more than testimony. 
That really in the end, they're just for show. That they're there to tell me something, which is this, that there will be nothing but utter eternal peace and security from evil forever. Why are the gates left open? Because there's no hell storming them. That we have already at this point in the book of Revelation, by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ, stormed the gates of hell and defeated them. It's as if God is saying that if I'm going to talk about my building a city for you, that the only way it's going to make sense for you is if I have this talk of walls and gates, because I know that's how you think in your human terms. So I will give you your walls and I will give you your gates, but I will swing wide those gates as testimony that you get to enter in and that no evil will ever enter in behind you. But there will be only from here on, for good forever, no evil hint of evil because the dragon has been laid low because this is what revelation says i mean you you read this again austin put this together and austin we did not talk about this did we we did not talk about this before and when he put together these readings and then all of a sudden like this is great everyone's going to be reading revelation 12 this week remember what you read in your advent readings and a great sign appeared in heaven and a woman clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. I think all of that is symbolism of talking about Israel. And it can also at once talk a little bit about Mary. This is the Christmas story in a unique way. And this woman was pregnant and she was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And this other sign appeared in heaven and behold, there was a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. I need this language of authority and power. But later on in Revelation 19, and this Satan, he came out, this dragon came out to deceive the nations, to gather them for battle. Their number was like the sand of the sea, and they marched up over the broad plain of the earth, and they surrounded the camp of the saints, the camp of the believers. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where he was tormented day and night forever and ever. Try and wrap your mind around this notion that when this city unfurls before us that the gates can be left wide open because there is no Satan. There is no devil devil there is no dragon with this fire rolling out of his nostrils nipping at our heels trying to devour us let alone jesus isn't that beautiful but it goes further because we have to hear these things john goes on and says you know i saw this new heaven and new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea and that seems so weird, especially if those of you, you like the sea and you like the ocean. Well, that kind of stinks. I really like that. But you've got to understand in ancient culture that the sea was a place. We've talked about this before. That in ancient culture, in the people of Israel, the sea was a place of chaos. It was a place of darkness. It was a place of, of evil. If you, if you read Isaiah, for example, you read the book of Job, constantly, even in Daniel, these, these great beasts would emerge from the seas and the oceans and attack God's people. And they were always representative of all of these evil nations, these powers and rulers and authorities. The Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Romans, who would come and seek to crush Israel. They would emerge merge up out of the sea. You want to know why these gates are open and they're never closed? It's not just because the dragon's been eliminated, but God has even gotten rid of the source of any form of evil. Any minion that the devil would ever set loose on us can't even emerge and threaten us ever again. Revelation chapter 12, remember it says here, the dragon, he was raged at the woman. And so he went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, against those who keep God's commands and hold fast to their testimony. Revelation 13, 1, the dragon, he stood on the shore of the sea, and, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea that the dragon called. 
And the beast was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. It was given authority and, and over every tribe, every people, every language, every nation. But look in Revelation 19, 19. This after the dragon's been hurled into the sea, John says, And I saw that beast and those kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war. But the beast as well was captured and was thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. And God himself has gotten away from the source of from which they came. You want to go even personal to every single individual or person that has ever done harm to you in your life. We are living lives that are populated by people who crush us by lies and by deceit and by idolatry and by greed and by sexual immorality. And yet look what it says in Revelation 21 as well. He who was seated on the throne, Jesus said, those who are victorious are going to inherit this city. And I will be their God and they will be my children. But, but the cowardly and the unbelieving and the vile and the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts in such a darkness, the idolaters, the liars. This is terribly uncomfortable for us to hear. But Jesus says they too will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. <laughs> and on no day will the city's gates ever be shut. For there will be no night there. Nothing impure will ever enter it. Nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful. The truth that we face in scripture are those, those who want nothing to do with the kingdom of God or his ways. And they are wreaking havoc in our world. But as one person said, which it sounds kind of crass, and I know it's for shock value, but he says, when you read the end of Revelation, you cannot help but realize that God gets the hell out of earth. <laughs> every semblance, every hint, every snatch of hell is consigned to being outside of this city. That there might be no tears. That there might be no sickness. That there might be no death that there might be no darkness. What do you want for Christmas? I want that. Gates that I can enter in, but the kind of gates that when I look back, I realize we don't even close them. Because all evil has been damned to hell. This is what God is making for us now and bringing to us as he comes. That's a perfect gift. And I've also wondered, and I'll close with this, I've also wondered what this means for us, not just tomorrow, because it's beautiful that we're going to have this existence where there can be gates, but they need not be closed. But what does it mean for today? I know there's a number of things that I could chase down. But there's two things that come to mind for me, and it's very important for the year we're going into in which we said, how seriously are we going to take this moment to speak beauty and truth and love into the lives of others? Because I read those humbling verses in Revelation 21, and I realize this is the perfect gift for me. This is the perfect gift. This is the perfect gift for everyone. Who has not yet heard? And is so weary from the dragon. Gotta think this has got to speak to us by way of witness. That maybe I might be able to come a little bit more uncomfortable that those might find why. But I also think to myself going into 2015 that really when I look at this, this ultimate picture of victory over evil that I found myself thinking again in 2015, you know what, really I should just open myself to the possibility that there could very well be a lot of victories in this coming year. A lot of victories over evil, and we gotta be open to that. Because though victory over evil has not happened yet in full, it's a little bit like I talked about last week, it's happening now in part. And you just never know when certain things will be conquered. 
I've been thinking a lot about Matthew chapter 8 this week. I preached on that a long time ago. That's that beautiful chapter where you hear the story when Jesus calms the seas. Do you remember that one? This great storm emerges when the disciples are in a boat. And then Jesus comes up. They wake him from his slumber, and he comes up, and he says, Be still. And all of the waters calm. And I've heard a lot of sermons in my life where we talk about, man, all the storms in life and how Jesus will calm them. And I think that's a pretty good point of application. But do you realize it's so much deeper than that? Because what Jesus is saying in that moment, he is speaking over evil, over the waters where the ancient world thought there was such chaos and darkness and impenetrable evil. Jesus, with just two words, be still, consigns evil back to the shores and says, no more. That this Jesus who defeats evil in full when all is said and done, he has power over evil now. So why don't we call on him? Partner with him in building a community in which those who have gates that were once slammed shut out of fear can be opened and left open because our God is a conquering. What do you want for Christmas? I hope you want gates. Wide open gates. That never need be shut again. Because that's the perfect gift.